is a grandson of his holiness Dijon Rinpoche. Rinpoche's late father, Dumsi Chengkela Rinpoche, was Dijon Rinpoche's son. So, why it's important for us is because uh, we hear what we practice as we all know. Sadhana practice, Hondo practice, basically every practice we do here has to do with Vijum Pesa's lineage. Therefore, we go to here. His presence here means a lot. It means everything for us. So I'm so happy to be able to experience here. And also, uh, personally, uh, I have a profound connection to Rinpoche. Uh, Rinpoche's previous incarnation is known as Pranum Sanjay Rinpoche. Pranum Sanjay Rinpoche was a great, great master, well known, both in Kaju and in my lineage. For me, with the karma, this is this is my my experience that I'm relating to. So it begins with the karma. So we've accumulated and inherited so much karma from not just this lifetime but from previous lifetimes. And the consequences and the end results of the karma that we have accumulated is endless. Now, some are positive. And of course, some of our karma is negative. So then the question is, the positive accumulated karma that we've accumulated, how do we benefit sentient beings with that? And the negative karmas that we have accumulated and that we are accumulating, what can we do to, to purify that? And with that thought, this is one thought that should turn your mind was the Dharma. Just simply thinking of this. Coming to the second reflection, the precious human birth is a result of our karma that we've accumulated. And of course, spiritually, as cliche as it sounds, that we always say the human birth is precious. But even from a scientific point of view, they concede that to be born as a human being has all the odds stacked against us, but therefore they also consider it that just the fact that we are born is a miracle in itself, right? So, now this, these two, karma, to contemplate on karma, I don't worry much because come, you know, the Sagadawa, you all will be concerned with that. <laughs> to reflect on the precious human birth, it's going to be a little more difficult. So I would emphasize, contemplate on this human birth that means somehow you did something good and right in your previous life through your connections at least to the Dharma and here you are again. You're given this opportunity once again to be on the path, to awaken and this is only so 
when you take a precious human blood. So you have to keep that in mind. Now, having taken this human blood, it brings us to the third reflection. Everything born is bound to die. Anything created is bound to dissolve. That's impermanence. So even having taken human birth, we just have a brief moment that the light will just be over just within an hour, blink of an eye. Impermanence, I don't need to stress what it is. It's not just your life. That's impermanence as well. But it is also Impermanence is also a burden on your heart because eventually we all are going to be separated from the things that we love, right? Impermanence is also accepting the fact that everything is in a constant state of change. One time your best friends will be the best of best friends. Two years later they may be your worst enemy, isn't it? Especially for the young people. You may fall in love with one girl today Tomorrow, you may just fall in love with another. That's also pain, right? That's what impermanence is. So you have reflecting on impermanence as well. What is the answer to impermanence? You must also turn your mind to the Dharma. That's another reason why you should. So don't worry if your girlfriend has rejected you. There have been many more girls in your life. <laughs> Nothing to worry about. Okay. And since impermanence is such a pain and a burden on our heart, this comes out to the fourth reflection, which is suffering. Not getting what we love is suffering. Losing what we love is suffering. There's physical suffering, there's mental suffering. And so what is the answer to, to escape this? That again is to turn our mind towards the Dharma. Okay, so these are the four reflections, very simple, you don't need to uh, do a scholarly research <laughs> into this. Uh, more simple you keep the practice, the more practical understanding you have of these four reflections, the more motivated you will be to, to do the Dharma. Now, having reflected on these four thoughts, what do we want to do? We want to cut through this compulsive uh, misunderstanding, uh, the ignorance that we find ourselves in. And how do we resolve this? So we take refuge. That means we're taking refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and the Sangha, as well as in uh, Vajrayana, we're also taking refuge in the three rooms. So why do, you want, why, why do you want to take great refuge? It's because we want to commit to awaken. We want to commit to end the suffering that we find ourselves in. We want to commit to not only end our own suffering, but also to end all sentient beings' suffering. In fact, that's one of the vows you will take, is to help all the sentient beings free of suffering. So we are taking a commitment in the highest form when you take refuge in the three jewels and the three rules. You are committing to the three jewels to give you protection. You are taking refuge in the three jewels to reveal the path to you. You are taking refuge in the three jewels because of your own devotion. So in the Dungeon there is a refuge and when you finally do take refuge, then you have to understand it when it comes to generating bodhicitta. Because if you've taken refuge, means you means you're committing to free all sentient beings. Therefore, it is automatically understood that this motivation must come from bodhicitta. So we must generate bodhicitta. This now comes in the main practice of refuge and bodhicitta. And we take our vow that until all beings have been free from suffering, that we will come again and again and to help them in whatever way we can, in whatever capacity that we can, right? So that is to generate bodhicitta. Now having taken <coughs> refuge and generating bodhicitta, we have to realize that 
whatever we do in life from the moment that we have committed to the Dharma till the end when we finally transition no matter what we do it's all about purification that's what it is because without purification there's no way we will be able to understand the depth and the profoundness of the teachings or even the empowerments that you receive or for that matter any dharmic activity that you do you will need purification and therefore this one we get to the purification part where we commit whatever uh, actions that we may have done in the past whether it is uh, it's been negative we make a commitment uh, with sincere regret and not to do that again and then this one room uh, the purification, purification section as a base in the practice of purification here now I'm jumping ahead a lot because wonder why it's important to wonder is because wonder is the foundation for all other practices if your foundation is strong uh, no matter what kind of house you build on top whether it's made of wood gold silver doesn't matter metal steel it'll stand without a strong foundation no matter what you build on the top it will never stay it will eventually collapse so that's why Hondro is the foundation of all practices and who hasn't finished the Hondro? so that sh should inspire you not just to receive the blessings but also motivate you simply put to reach the state of state of awakening to realize your own true Buddha nature that's what Guru Yoga does for you when you're looking at your Guru of course some criticism people level is that in Tibetan Vajrayana especially we have too much Guru worship or Lama worship and things like that so fair enough if you're looking at it from the outside no problem but if you're a Vajrayana practitioner when you are concentrating on the guru you are actually looking at yourself your guru is the reflection of your own buddha nature this is what you have to understand when you look at your Tsavi lama that is who you are that's what your what your primordial nature is so guru yoga is very profound uh, i would get instructions from the Tsavi lama Yoguchi and how to do it if not if you don't do guru yoga practice at all you're young people like all of you i don't expect you to do guru yoga but nevertheless you can do a very simple form of guru yoga you wake up in the morning all you do is before any thoughts and before you have any concepts when your mind is just fresh in the morning i'm sure you get up late so whether you get up in the morning or you get up in the afternoon Think of the Tsavi Lama or think of Guru Ramuchi. First thing, very simple practice, it doesn't take anything. Before you sleep, always think of your Tsavi Lama or Guru Ramuchi. This is the simplest form of Guru Yoga that you can do. You don't have to do any kind of uh, visualization or anything like that. Okay, you got that? Yeah. You can do that, you guys can do that. I think you guys already committed before. You